So I've never really done this before, but I thought I would give a quick lesson in algaes, as many of you are interested in marine science. Now, all life on Earth occurs in one of these three main domains. All plants and algaes fall in the domain eukarya, or the eukaryotes, which means they have a nucleus in their cells. Here in this phylogenetic tree, you can see the relationship fungi have to animals and how closely they are related. You can also see where red algae falls in terms of land plants and green algae and how they are closely related. If they come on the same branch, that means they share ancestry. Now, all algae are protists. What are protists? Protists are defined by the fact that there's only a single cell type or a single tissue type. There isn't differentiated tissues in the body of the organism. In introductory biology, you may have learned about protists and how diverse they are. The reason why there is so much diversity is because of the processes and how they evolved. Endosymbiosis occurs with a lot of protists over time where one protist would engulf another and thus take on the traits of the protist it engulfed. Algaes, which are eukaryotes with chloroplasts in them, evolved from cyanobacteria being acquired or engulfed, and those cyanobacteria, which can photosynthesize, thus becoming the plastids, such as chloroplast, in those cells. A secondary engulfing resulted in even more diversity, which we'll see in the next slide. Here is a demonstration of how diversity of protists arose. In the beginning, you had single cell organisms that would engulf things like cyanobacterium. When an organism engulfs a cyanobacterium, that cyanobacterium now functions as a plastid or an organelle in the cell, which can do all the things that the original cell could do. If that cell could photosynthesize, now that organism now has the capability of photosynthesizing. So the engulfment of cyanobacteria, which could photosynthesize, resulted in the evolution of red and green algae. You can see here that it's likely that red and green algae were the ancestors to a lot of the other protists we observe in the seas, in lakes, in waters, and in soil. Here is a phylogenetic tree portraying many of the protists that have been classified. Here you can see where these organisms share ancestry. For the sake of this lecture, I want you to focus on these three types of seaweeds, red algae, brown algae, and green algae. They are all protists, and they're defined as such because they have no differentiated tissues. Although some of them look like plants, they do not have true roots, true stems, or true leaves. All the cells in the body of the organism are functionally similar. All these algaes contain chlorophyll A, which is the most common type of chlorophyll, but other types of chlorophyll like chlorophyll B and C. And you may see other pigments like carotenoids, which can explain the color of those algaes. Now seaweeds can only occur where there is sunlight. So if you're in a water body and you see no light, it's not likely you'll see any algae. But there have been examples of algae occurring in places where then less, little less than 1% of sunlight is still reaching. Just like land plants, algae go through the alternation of generations where they have both a sporophyte generation and gametophyte generation. Seen here in the picture, you can see how the gametophytes produce male and female structures, thus producing sperm and eggs through meiosis, and the junction of the sperm and egg results in the formation of a sporophyte. The sporophyte produces sporangia, which produces haploid spores, which give rise to new gametophytes. Let's begin by talking about brown algae. Now, if you've seen Finding Dory, you may have noticed some of the large kelp forests that exist. These are all brown algae. Now, these are considered complex algae, but remember, all the cell types are the same. There's only a single cell type. They are multicellular, 
and predominantly marine. They can get very, very, very long, up to six meters long, and they're brown due to the carotenoids that exist in their plastids. Here we see the structure of a typical brown algae. You have the blades, which function like leaves, a stipe, which functions like a stem, and an holdfast, which is simply for holding and anchoring. While these structures function like you would see in land plants, they're not morphologically any different from each other. Their cell types are all the same. For comparison, we can see here, when we see a seaweed versus a land plant, you have a blade which functions like a leaf, you have a stipe which functions like a stem, and you have a holdfast which functions like a root. All these cells, however, are absorptive. So unlike a land plant which uses the roots to absorb, all these cells can absorb in the brown algae. Here we see the holdfast of brown algae. They are not roots. Their function is primarily to hold the algae to various substances in the water, to anchor them. Several kelps will have these large bulbs for flotation. They fill with air and add buoyancy to the plant. Here are red algae, which in my opinion are the prettiest of the algae. They are red because of their pigments, like phycolipid proteins, which give them that red color. Included in these families are nori, the seaweed we use to make sushi. As you can read from the slide, there are some slight differences in the cells which make them different from other algae and other plants. They lack an endoplasmic reticulum, and their thylakoids are not stacked like they are in land plants. If you wanted to pick up a new hobby, pressing round algae is a fun one. You take the red algae and you lay it on paper and you let it dry out and they make pretty, pretty patterns. And now we get to our green algae. Green algae are most similar to our land plants because they contain green chloroplasts. There are two main groups that share ancestry, the charophytes, which is where the land plants evolved from, and the chlorophytes, which has most of our green algae. More than 7,000 species of green algae comprise the chlorophytes. They occur in freshwater environments and marine environments, sometimes even in terrestrial environments. Some are single cellular and may occur in colonies. Others are multicellular and are a little bit bigger. Floating on top of ponds, you may have seen some pond scum or volvox. You may have even seen green algae on the side of your fish tank at home. Here are two examples of multicellular green algae. On the picture on the left, you have sea lettuce, which at times may be anchored, but also may occur free floating in the water. You also have calerpa in the picture on the right, which may be anchored to some substrate in the water and have the resemblance as mini palm leaves. If learning about algae interests you, I strongly recommend you contact Dr. Adolf as this is his specialty.